I no, I don't. Okay. Exciting. I, I feel bad I pressed the button twice. Third time's the charm, maybe? It's a countdown. That looks ominous. I hope good things happen in the future of Europe. I, I threatened to do this talk without slides, but it's yeah. better with. All right. It's doing something. It's a DJ. That is not mine. That's not me. Okay. Press the button again. Oh, oh. As soon as I push the button. I'll try one more time. I'm on HDMI, but I, it's like some, it says it's like a VGA horrible adapter thing. So, yep. That's from Scale. That should be uh, rotating through their web page when there is no one attached. Yes. Well. Yes, when I, when I press the button. All righty. Some of the connectors are loose. There, there's like 15 adapters. Yeah. There's it's really scary. To, yeah, display port to. <coughs> um. There's one small cable down here, and then it's just adapters all the way down. Seated. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. Good resolution. You got that. Oh. Gold okay. Thing. So, is that squished? I can't tell. I'm going to set it to what they asked for, and if it goes blank, then we know what the problem was. All right. So, revert. Great. I know. Okay. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you for your patience, and thank you for coming to my talk. Uh, Ubuntu is my favorite operating system, and it has been for a very, very long time. And so one of the neat things about Ubuntu is that it's, it's always changing. It's always getting better and improving. And um, there's some really big improvements and changes in this uh, next cycle. So uh, you may have seen them in uh, October for Ubuntu 17.10. And you might be on the LTS release and happy with 16.04 and wondering what's in store. Uh, in 18.04, you will have heard that the interface, everything changed, and you may be wondering why. And that's what I'm here to talk about, is the changing face of Ubuntu. Now, me, myself, my name is Nathan Haynes. I'm an author. You may know me from such books as Be uh, Beginning Ubuntu for Windows and Mac users. Thank you. Or such books as Beginning uh, Ubuntu for Windows and Mac users, second edition. <laughs> so, um, and so having started with 14.04 and now 16.04, and um, I don't know about 18.04 yet. That's a publisher decision. Um, um, I was really there for the last bits, d dug in, and uh, now everything is different and changed, so I'm not looking forward to that. If I have to rewrite my book for just uh, the interface, redo all the screenshots. Um, I'm an Ubuntu member, I'm the leader of the Ubuntu California Loco team, and I'm a computer enthusiast. So I've followed Linux for a very, very long time. Back when I was uh, doing dial-up BBSs and um, playing with DOS and my Windows INI file for Windows 3.0, and I remember those old Linuxy things. And so um, what I want to talk about today is um, where Ubuntu's been and where it's going. Now, Ubuntu, like I said, has changed over the years. We're, we're at actually at the beginning of a big change right now. Ubuntu um, started off with GNOME 2, which is a very classic interface. And then in 
2011 changed to Unity, which got bigger and better and more powerful and more streamlined. And um, so 16.04 was really kind of the pinnacle of uh, Unity on the desktop. Um, when it came time to, uh, uh, so Ubuntu was about 11 and a half years old when 16.04 came out. And with the release of um, 17.04, that was the last release that shipped with Unity, um, a very beautiful release that was um, uh, not, not too bad now. Um, so uh, from that transition to Ubuntu being about 12 and a half years old to 17.10 was the 13th anniversary of the Ubuntu release. And at 13 years old, um, everything changed. Things looked different. Uh, the textures on the long screen were a bit different. Um, everything was kind of familiar, but it was a little crankier, um, a little buggy because of the big transition, and suddenly um, strange new features were popping up in places where there weren't features before. And so for that 13th anniversary birthday of Ubuntu, um, things have really changed. And so um, we see that 17 was a very, very, very big change. So I want to talk about um, where Ubuntu began and how, how Ubuntu started what the purpose of the project was, and how those changes have sort of um, uh, come about, because it's, I think it's a sort of an interesting story. In the beginning, it was not Ubuntu. Now, uh, the world of uh, Unix really stretches back to about 1968 or 9. I'm not going to go back that far. Um, Linux started in September 91. I'm not going to go back quite that far, although if we look back um, there, we have a really cool uh, Unix-like kernel for the 386. Um, at the time, a lot of people who were working on, at, uh, on computers at universities were using uh, some sort of Unix-like OS uh, on a VAX or a PDP or uh, something similar. And um, if you're programming um, and you're working on computers, you want something very, very similar. At the time, uh, we did a BSD, uh, which were various licensing reasons. It wasn't quite sure if you could redistribute it. And so um, when Linus Torvalds, um, a university uh, student at the University of uh, Helsinki in Finland, said, I'm going to write my own kernel. And just for fun, it'll never be anything really big, but I, wanna, I just want to do it. And um, meanwhile, the new project uh, had been trying to re-implement Unix um, from the user space out and working inwards towards the kernel, still working on that kernel. Um, uh, the, everything came into place at the right time, and so we had this really great ecosystem where we had this free software user space. We had suddenly, from nowhere, this uh, Unix-like kernel. Um, the free software guys jumped in and said, you know what's the best license ever is the GPL. Linus Tolvat says, I, just, I don't really care. I just want people to be able to share it and use it and improve it if it's useful for them, because that's what I'm doing. Um, and boom, suddenly we had Linux. Now, Linux back then was literally, you had FTP sites with source code with all the utilities, and you had the Linux kernel that you could go and compile. And so to be useful, um, uh, Linux wasn't useful, it was just a kernel, you had to get everything else. And so different groups, because everything was free to redistribute, were able to take this, and so we have this uh, soft landing um, system, which was the first Linux distro. Uh, Slackware showed up uh, very, very uh, soon thereafter. Debian showed up uh, about three months later, and I think 92, I want to say. And so um, Debian came around and said, we want to be a completely free operating system, and we want to uh, have lots of uh, utilities and be very, very useful. Now, uh, so between these different distros, um, Slackware and Debian and Red Hat kind of uh, came about as well around the same time. We were able to, you were able to actually go in and get a bunch of files and burn them to a disk and boot off of it, and make a boot floppy. And um, for as little or for as few as eight floppies, boot floppy, root floppy, and then package floppies, you too could have a Linux system at home on your IBM PC. So it was a really, really cool thing. And you'd, uh, you'd boot from it, you'd, you'd switch back and forth, um, you'd hit enter to unmap a floppy or you get a kernel panic uh, in the good old days. And um, you'd have an installation screen, and you'd have a, a categories, um, accessories, communications, uh, engineering, science, math, documentation, uh, uh, programming, compilers, text editors, graphics, games. And you'd go through, and you'd have maybe, depending on the, on the release, you'd have maybe anywhere from um, 200 to 2,000 to maybe 5,000 
packages that you could, during install, you'd be prompted to pick the packages you wanted to install to have a working system. Um, you had a good default selection. It was up to you to um, not uncheck things that you needed to install, like drivers and the kernel and X and bash. So, um, or TC shell or, or whatever else you were using at the time. Um, as free software gained momentum and Linux became more popular, this grew and grew, and suddenly we had CD-ROMs. Um, I remember when I got back into Linux after the old, old, old days, like the first, my first experience with Linux was a dial-up shell as a BBS. And when I wanted to do it myself, a friend's dad was an engineer, uh, and so he gave me a five CD collection. And I, my first experience with, uh, with installing locally was Debian 1.0. And if you check Wikipedia, there is no Debian 1.0 because InfoMagic took Debian 0 0.93 release uh, 6 between the uh, 8 out to ELF transition where the way binaries were compiled was completely different. Threw that on a CD and said Debian 1.0 and it didn't work. And I said, well, Debian's not so good. I'll maybe use Slack or Red Hat. Um, and uh, um, Debian was fine, just uh, it, it, that was not what we got. So um, the first Debian release is 1.1, um, but that was still a five CD set full of different, different software. And when I got back into 2003, uh, SUSE 9.0 was like four or five CDs. And you download all the CDs and you'd boot, you get a nice uh, easy text uh, uh, installer or graphical installer, depending on the distro. And you can then choose from like 3,000 installs, um, any of your favorite of 50 different text editors and so on. And so, uh, and then you would, and then would have you swap out disks and you wouldn't use every disk. You would have to download all the disks because you didn't know what packages you, packages you had and what disks they were on. So back in the days you'd spend um, maybe a day and a half downloading like five, six, seven CDs and then um, you'd use like two of them, maybe like the last one and then your, because the printer drivers like on Windows was always like on last disk. And so things were really complex. You could have any system you want, you wanted, but uh, if you were an engineer, a programmer, and a had a lot of Unix experience, you could have the perfect system. But if you were like me and you were just getting started, you could wind your way through, but it was kind of really tricky. It was kind of really scary. So things changed. In 2004, a Debian developer named Mark Shuttleworth said, you know, I'm going to, um, I think we can do better. Free software is the future. He, he had uh, built his own company named Thought um, out of free software because <coughs> he came from humble beginnings. Made it really big. Was on the first, uh, when you go to websites and they have SSL certificates, uh, that's what Thought did um, just back before VeriSign. Sold to VeriSign, made a ton of money, um, traveled up to the space station um, on his own dime and was on the Mir for a week uh, doing cool Japanese space agency experiments and probably drinking vodka. Uh, Americans, you can't, Americans don't drink in space. It's completely wrong and horrible because alcohol is bad. Um, the Russians hide vodka. They, they, they get sent with their shipments. So <laughs> they don't drink constantly, but you know, you're off your shift. It's a holiday. You know, I'm sure New Year's is a blast on the Russian module. So he went up and he did that. And so he gave back. He says, well, how can I give back? Free software gave me all this. I, I, I want to do philanthropy. So he said, let's Really take free software, and let's just um, uh, let's showcase it. It can be bigger and better. And so the idea of um, I described Linux for engineers was really, really great and really cool and fun to play with because I loved DOS and all those codes and had the time because I was 15, 16 to play with it. But he had the idea of Linux for human beings. And so the concept was let's take uh, let's get everything together and let's have one CD that you can download. Let's make sure it fits in a no more than a 650 megabyte disk because the 700 megs were um, not rare anymore, but still more expensive. And let's get one disk that you put in and you, ins you install, and it installs in 30 minutes. It doesn't even ask you any questions. Um, you get um, one best of class desktop environment. You get one good office suite, one good web browser, one good instant messenger, and you just have everything there. And so Ubuntu 4.10, looked like this. It was very simple, very brown, very GNOME 2. And um, it wasn't so bad, actually. Uh, uh, I remember hearing the release on Slashdot, and I was thinking, um, uh, it was, oh, so of course this is based on uh, Debian. Let's take Debian every six months. Um, Debian's going between two and three years every release. 
the, the uh, stable version had all added eight software. He said, let's take Debian and stable, and every six months we're going to freeze it, polish it, knock all the bugs, just pick specific software that we can really showcase and make really better, contribute upstream, and we're going to showcase this. Now, when this first was released, I, heard on, I read on Slashdot, which is what I read uh, at the time. Now it's Reddit, but Slashdot. And I said, oh, um, I read the article and said, some self-made millionaire is making himself a vanity distro, and it's going to be uh, all around community. I'm like, community? Uh, yeah, I'd, uh, I'll, I'll pass. Um, six months later, when, um, when uh, uh, 504 uh, came out, there was a, uh, the new release was coming on Slashdot. There was a ton of buzz, and I said, well, it's free, uh, there wouldn't still be buzz if there wasn't something to this. So I said, I'm going to try it out. And I did, and it was amazing because everything just worked. Um, and I didn't have like five text editors and like three versions of Solitaire and you know, everything. So I'm like, this is pretty cool, actually. And of course, um, I, at that time, I could go in and install everything and start tweaking text files and changing, um, I should have the XKCD in here, like changing uh, X386 config at the time. Um, but I, don't, I never really wanted to do those things. I just wanted to get to work. So I um, had a PDF viewer, everything installed. So it was, it was really, 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 really great. And on the community side, um, at the time, uh, it's hard to remember a time now when, when you went to a Linux forum and every, they still exist today, but every single forum, you go in and you're a beginner and you don't know where to begin because everything's, you thought Windows works with computers. And no surprise, uh, Unix stretches back to the 50s in heritage. Um, the 70s and actuality, and um, it does everything completely different because Windows had, was, didn't exist, and VMS didn't exist, um, and so on. Uh, uh, so, and CPM didn't exist. That's where Windows gets its inspiration. So you go online and you get asked before and say, well, uh, I have some questions, and they'd say, you know, they call you a noob. You'd say, they wouldn't even bother to type it out. They'd say, RTFM. If anyone remembers what that stands for. For those of you who don't, it means read the fine manual. And, and the world was a different place back then. Um, you were expected to um, start looking through source code to find your answers before you went, to, um, uh, to went online. And it's reasonable to expect to do some work before you went online, but they were, there was no forgiveness at all whatsoever. Um, so if the Ubuntu project was founded. Now, Ubuntu is an ancient African, African philosophy um, uh, of humanity towards others. Um, so what it means is um, that if... Uh, you know, we're all, we're all human, we're all in one community, and if I help you, um, I don't just lift you up, but I lift our whole community and lift myself up as well, which is the best, most succinct definition of free software I think I've ever heard. So when I realized that um, um, this wasn't just a line, that they really actually did uh, expect people to be kind and polite, and they, they lived by this philosophy on the Ubuntu forums, there was a code of conduct, I said, you know, this is something I want to be associated with. The software is wonderful. The people are great. I Google a problem, put Ubuntu at the end. I get the answer. I said, this is, this is great. Ubuntu got better and browner. Uh, this here is Ubuntu 606. Um, after a couple of releases, we said, you know, everything's going great. We, we haven't missed any deadlines. Um, we have really good first-class desktop use. It's getting really popular. Let's, um, no one can use it on, on servers or in business because it's every six months. Let's take a release and let's, let's sit down and focus on making it really super stable. Um, and let's support it instead of just for 18 months, which is a year and a half. Um, let's, let's support it for longer. Let's, let's go with three years. So you can install it on a, on a server and um, not incur the wrath of IT. Um, and so we spent about six, extras, six or eight extra weeks working on uh, Ubuntu 604. And because the date slipped from April to, uh, to June, it uh, became Ubuntu 606 LTS. And this was the first uh, version. Now, by this time, we see that um, things are a little more shiny at the time. Uh, glossy, shiny textures were the big thing, so the title bar is a little shinier, it's a little browner. Um, it's a little more Ubuntu-y. And we have, two years later, 804. We, on time, did our second LTS, and this is where Ubuntu um, really started, Classic Ubuntu really started to take shape and, and got a lot of, uh, lot of buy-in. I think uh, we we're starting to uh, look at cloud technologies like Eucalyptus, um, which was sort of a cool thing. And, um, and um, now it's all open stack, but we got in on that too um, in an extra release or two. And of course, use Compiz. So if you took that window and you 
took out your mouse and shook it, the window would wobble like, a, like it was made of jelly, um, which is fun. But if you took two windows um, and moved them side by side um, to line them up, they'd stick, um, you know, so they didn't overlap for a little bit, but they would squish a little bit. So you get a little bit of feedback when you did that. Um, I miss, I don't miss the spinning desktop cube, which was awesome, but I never really used. I do miss wobbly windows. Now, Ubuntu at this time had really made a name for itself, and it got more popular. And so what happened was that um, we had had this really brown look, this really that harkened back to uh, Africa and the desert. Now, humans all come. Every human here, if you trace back, came out of Africa. Um, maybe several times, actually. It's really complex. But we all came from one place. We're all shared humanity. Uh, free software is a shared community. And so that was a really great way to focus on. As Ubuntu came into a more professional type of uh, look, it was decided that Mark Schilderworth said it's time to rebrand and leave the brown behind a little bit and the tans and the rich uh, deep browns and oranges. And let's go with a brand new look. And so Ubuntu had a new look, a new sleek look <coughs> that really focused on lightness and uh, dependability and re reliability. And um, so Ubuntu went from, from brown to purple and orange, mostly orange. And so we got a new look that was slightly refined, but we had a brand new look on the desktop. Um, and that was the beginning of um, some major changes. Now Ubuntu by itself uh, was still going super strong. At the same time, GNOME 2 that Ubuntu was built on, GNOME 2 is a fantastic desktop environment that survives today in uh, Mate, and I forget the other uh, fork that is also excellent. I think one's Budgie, maybe. Um, I knew this when I got up here. But anyway, um, uh, at the same time, GNOME was starting to look at its vision for the future. And it had some very strong ideas uh, as to how it wanted that future uh, of computing to look and how to sort of revolutionize things. And Ubuntu and Canonical also had some really strong ideas on how they wanted computing to work. And they wanted to change things and make things faster and more connected. Now, as it turned out, at the time, GNOME um, has always had strong opinions, and Ubuntu is founded. Let's take Debian and make some very strong opinions um, so that you have, um, um, we had to ship VI as a text editor, for example, because um, if you don't, um, then uh, you get your Linux license taken away. Um, and uh, of course, it shipped with Nano, which is the best text editor uh, ever. Um, <laughs> thank, thank you. Nano is the new Ed, if you ask me. Who here, uh, who here uses VI? And so keep your hand up if you, it's because you tried it and you, uh, years ago and you still can't figure out how to quit. Okay. Yeah, VI has two modes, beep repeatedly, break everything. Um, Emacs, of course, wasn't shipped with it because it's giant and huge. Emacs stands for Escape Meta Alt Control Shift. Um, um, but their philosophy was we'd make one good choice, VIs and everything, Nano's good for beginners, we'll ship that. Um, but if you want Emacs, you can go get it. Super easy, one command, it, you have it, you make your best, best system. And so Ubuntu was founded on strong choices. And GNOME also had strong choices. The problem is, is um, Ubuntu said, you know, we've been, we've been lost up, we're shipping the newest version of GNOME, GNOME comes out in March, and we come out in April, so uh, we're always on lockstep. Let's work together and make something really cool. Uh, you have GNOME shells, has some interesting ideas. We have some good ideas to make it more user-friendly and a little more powerful. And GNOME, well, in my unbiased opinion, let me just say GNOME uh, decided that they had a strong opinion and didn't want to bother with collaboration and working. They wanted to get their own ideas out and focus on that, which is valid. Um, but they weren't too friendly to uh, ideas for enhancements and so on. And so their vision uh, was different than what Ubuntu wanted. And so Ubuntu decided that they needed to uh, go ahead and, and take their vision because GNOME 3 wasn't looking so good at the very beginning uh, not as far as user friendliness goes. So in 2010, we had a brand new feel. And uh, as netbooks started becoming the big new thing, screen sizes got smaller and we had more and more connectivity and so on, it was decided that we needed a brand new look. And so, um, so in uh, Ubuntu 11.04, uh, Unity was released 
Now in uh, 1010, if no one remembers uh, the netbook remix, but uh, there was a very simplified sort of early proto Unity that was just perfect for really uh, tiny little screens uh, on netbooks. And that simplified things, and so we took that and applied it to the desktop. Now, the good news is that um, over the years, this got bigger and better. Um, the bad news is 11.04 was a little rough. It worked out. You could work around the, um, learn how things worked and work around the changes. It wasn't that bad. Um, the better news was that 11.10 was really good, and 12.04 focus was saying, let's make this really polished, really good for power users. Um, but this was the new look of Ubuntu, the launcher on the left to uh, reduce space, um, one top panel uh, at the top. If you maximize a window, uh, the, the title bar disappears into the top panel, so you're not wasting space. Uh, rather than um, playing a game of uh, what happens when I click this uh, notification icon, this tray icon, um, if I click or right click, do I, do I get a menu? Do I activate a feature? Do I open a window? Do I close a window? Do I run a program? Do I, you know, make a, uh, a change? Rather, uh, we had these great menus that um, had a networking menu that gave you your network status, your uh, sound menu that gave you uh, volume sliders for your uh, speakers, your mic if you were recording, um, uh, play and pause and status of your uh, rhythm box or VLC players, um, everything all in one place. And so that did get refined. This is 1204. This is the first LTS. Got refined, it's a little prettier, a little sleeker. And the other thing Unity really did very, very well. Um, this was the first standalone where they said, we're going to make this a power user interface where you can do everything from the keyboard. And so sure enough, there was a great feature called HUD, uh, where if you're in LibreOffice or GIMP or some other uh, 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 program with really powerful, complex, arcane menus, um, if you're a power user, you probably know if you tap the uh, Alt key, you get a little, you highlight the menus, you can use the arrow keys to move, or Alt F goes to file, Alt E goes to edit, and so on. If you just tap Alt, you get a search bar um, then, that you can just type in what you wanted to do, and it filters through and searches the menu options and shows you them along with the bre breadcrumb trail to where it was. So one, um, you can just tell the computer what you want to do, and two, if you actually did need to find that in the menus later, it already taught you how to do that. You could go through and pick the one and run it right from there. Best thing ever. In 1210, um, the uh, idea was, was made to have web integration. And so, um, for example, if you went to Gmail or uh, Google Play or Amazon Music, you could go in. And um, so the nice thing about the launchers is you, had, you could see what was open. And the cool thing about the launchers here is that if you had like new email, for example, you'd have like an icon and you'd have like a little badge number when new emails or new messages came in, you'd have progress bars. Um, and so the idea was, uh, was uh, made to let's bring web pages and let's have a Firefox extension. If you go to Yahoo Mail and a mail comes in, you get a notification on the screen and you get a little uh, icon there. You, uh, Yahoo Mail will be a separate icon in the launcher. If you click it, it switches to your browser and the right tab. If you're listening to music, um, you can actually play and pause and do, do next track in Spotify, Pandora, and so on from the sound menu. And that was a beautiful, beautiful feature that only was around for about a year because unfortunately um, it didn't catch buy-in. Um, Ubuntu was a little too early and uh, the uh, W3C had some ideas for web integration that weren't quite compatible and uh, also nobody, nobody adopted those changes themselves, which I thought was a really, really good change. Um, but as we got closer and closer to this idea of accessing information from everywhere, um, the idea became that Ubuntu could be a single platform for many, many different devices. Already Ubuntu through Unity could bring in, if you had uh, lots of programs running, you had um, lots of features through Sad Menu and so on, where you could in one place in your shell uh, control all of them. Like I said, it works perfect for music and so on. Um, through the Unity launcher, you could also search online. So for example, if I searched um, music, I could search not only my library, but the Amazon uh, MP3 music store. I could search um, uh, you know, my audio tracks on, uh, some, uh, I don't remember the service anymore, I think Google Play was one of them. Um, you, could actually, you could actually search for music online, get listings, and you could preview the music. So if you saw, if you didn't have an album, if you did have an album, you could go through and hit play, and, preview the tracks. If you didn't, but it was on Amazon, you could actually 
you could actually take a look and see, and you could, you could actually hit play right there in your shell. Uh, and, and if you liked it, you could click buy, you go to the web page and you could buy it there. Um, Ubuntu launched its own uh, web service called Ubuntu One that had file syncing as well, as well as a music store, and it did the exact same thing. So, um, so the evolution of this was, let's, have, let's make Ubuntu a platform where you can write a program once, use these services once, and it can run on any device. And that was really, really, really cool. So what we have here in 1604 is the last version of Unity where it was really, really powerful. And we had this ability to, uh, about 1504 actually, about a year before, where we could have a phone. And we could have different programs. We had a really nice Unity dash that, because of the phone, gave you your weather right there. It gave you all your applications. You could, you could run, um, uh, you could you know, sort of play music. Um, through edge swipes, you could pull up the launcher just like you had in Ubuntu. Um, you could go through your task list. And we went, um, we developed Unity for the phones and kind of worked backwards and sort of, um, let's, let's work back. We, are, we know the perfect desktop is Unity. So let's make sure everything works really great on phones and tablets and work backwards. And so while work on that never finished, um, it was, we could take these exact same programs, if you look on the right there, uh, uh, the Dash, Music, Web Browser, and, and a, a Terminal, and on a tablet you could turn on uh, stage, uh, or turn on uh, uh, computer mode, and you could get the, you could switch and get the exact same thing in Windows that were movable. This is on the Nexus 7, but it looked the exact same thing on a, as on a computer. These same programs, um, automatically adapted to the form factor you're using. So you could have a phone, and you could be on there, and you could get your information. And then when you got to the hotel room, you get to scale, you go up to the hotel room, you don't need to bring your laptop. You go up to your hotel room, you get your HDMI adapter, plug it into the TV, and it automatically adapts to this. It was there, it existed, it was a great idea, it was working. Um, and unfortunately, after several years of working on this, um, there was just no industry buy-in. We had several, uh, we did have a BQ in Spain and Meizu in China that had actually shipped devices and were working. Um, cells were iffy, the software wasn't quite there. Uh, you could really see, see where it was going. And if you, ha we had them here at scale, if you've been here, you've seen the devices. Um, people read them on the web, about on the web and say, that sounds really weird, I don't understand. And then they get to the booth and say, so I heard about this thing, and it was really weird, I don't understand. I said, well, here's a tablet, try it. And the moment someone swiped in from the left edge and saw the launcher, swiped in, saw the apps, clicked, we, go to, we switched to desktop mode and everything came up, uh, the, uh, the light bulb turned on. Uh, touching was believing, it was really great. Unfortunately, after several years, it didn't catch on. And so it didn't make sense anymore to focus on this because the, de the, the traditional desktop was kind of stagnating. And um, this vision of sort of uh, was really, really expensive and didn't catch on. And so unfortunately, uh, just uh, before Ubuntu 1704 was launched, it was announced uh, last, about a year ago that Unity uh, was canceled and was no longer going to be the future of Ubuntu. And so um, a lot of people were really happy. A lot of people were, were really sad. And so the future of Ubuntu then was in question because Unity had defined what Ubuntu was for six long years. And so we know that Unity was built on, Ubuntu has always been built on Debian, always been built on GNOME. And even when we used Unity, um, we still used GNOME. Um, just we just didn't use GNOME shell. We put a Unity in as a shell and we worked on that. Uh, but we still used all the great GNOME apps like uh, Mind and Solitaire and Calculator and the settings and the software settings. So it's all, all, you know, we've always been close to GNOME, um, but not interface-wise. So the answer was obviously return to GNOME. But GNOME looks like this. And so as pretty and clean as that is, um, that does, it's not very Ubuntu-y. Um, for one thing, everything's giant. Um, two, the launcher's gone. So if you go from, now any of, you here who are an expert uh, who use VI but put your hand down when I said who, who couldn't figure out how to quit, you can figure everything out for yourself and customize it and you probably already know the 20 extensions you need to make GNOME shell usable um, for you on your computer. But if we go from 1604 um, to, to this, surprise, 1804 uh, update in July and you get this, 
a lot of people are going to be really upset because nothing works the same way, everything's uh, completely different, um, they're going to be lost. So um, while the idea was to go back to GNOME, it was clear that we needed to do something else. And so um, what happened was after the transition was announced, Canonical sent some employees to Guadec, uh, which is a GNOME com conference, and they were sitting around and saying, you know, we really want to just make some just slight customizations. Um, GNOME has, GNOME really expects the distro to do a lot of customization and uh, GNOME sort of hard codes a lot of things. So for example, if a distro has, if a session has a default uh, plugin, um, you can never ever disable that plugin ever. It's just not possible. GNOME doesn't allow it. Um, so uh, the question was, well, if we, if we ship a plugin, um, it can't be disabled and all plugins, uh, GNOME automatically updates the plugins so we can't we can't ensure uh, that our uh, software cycle is respected and we can't support things. What do we do? So uh, a couple bold decisions were made. And so um, at Guadec, um, I think Olivier Tiloy was, uh, and uh, someone else, I can't remember, Ken Van Dyne, were talking to some GNOME people and they said, you know, we just want to make some changes. We want to have them separate so that we can kind of put all our changes here. So we're not changing everything to GNOME, but we're, we, have, we have a way to customize. And I said, well, we have this feature called session support. Why don't you use that? And I said, ah, tell me more. So sessions in GNOME is a way that you can um, sort of ship with a, a, a profile that uh, then sort of um, uh, has some defaults. Um, but you can, you can have different sessions and different profiles. So if you look at 17.10 right now, actually, this is 17.10. This is actually Bionic. This is 18.04 as of yesterday. Um, this is what it looks like now. And this is what really 17.10 looks like. Um, so this is a default. If you upgrade uh, to the newest version of Ubuntu, it's going to look like this. Now you'll notice it looks a lot like Unity. It's very familiar. Um, we didn't bother to re-implement Unity, um, so there's no big friendly button. Um, the panels, uh, the indicators are mostly gone. Um, time's in the center. Um, but we put the icons back to a human size, which is, I think, very nice. We have a launcher on the left. And while it doesn't do a lot of the things that uh, Unity did, um, it is that still, still, still same familiar look. And so uh, rather than go and do our own extensions, there was already a fantastic extension called Dash uh, for GNOME, a plugin called Dash to Dock. It was a fantastic plugin, and it did pretty much what we wanted. It did more than what we wanted, actually. Um, so we said, well, let's maybe, we don't want to support this forever and all these changes, um, but we need to support what we ship. So let's maybe talk to Dash to Dock and see what they say about, um, well, what if we sort of um, uh, fork the plugin so it gets a different, um, a, a different uh, fingerprint uh, ID so it's not constantly, so when Dash to Dock can do their own thing and we're not, Ubuntu users aren't getting updated without a warning or a recourse. And let's maybe reduce some of the features, make it very, very simple, change the defaults, ship with something, you know, friendly, um, and then maybe think about how we can work with Dash to Dock. So uh, the Dash to Dock developers were like, this is a great idea, let's work together. And so um, a fork was made, it's in the Dash to Dock, uh, the Ubuntu Dock is um, in the GitHub repository for Dash to Dock. It's a subset, it doesn't have all the features. Um, any specific features we added specifically for Ubuntu um, has a different namespace. And so what happens is that um, when you make changes to, um, to, to the Ubuntu dock and you say, you know, I've been using Ubuntu now for a couple of months and now I'm an expert and I just want more and I want dash to dock, you can go and in install dash to dock. Ubuntu dock cannot be disabled. GNOME does not allow it. It's impossible. So when Ubuntu dock detects that you've installed dash to dock and it's active, the Ubuntu dock automatically hides itself so it gets out of the way. Any settings you've changed that are common um, are reflected in dash to dock because they're the same thing. And when you go in and you change like the launcher size or, or other uh, more advanced dash to dock settings that we don't necessarily support, if you uninstall dash to dock and you, so Ubuntu dock pops up automatically, so you, you, so you're never left without a way to like, n without a way to, to launch programs. All those same features, um, we don't support them, we don't expose them, but um, Ubuntu dock respects those features. So you can move back and forth, try it out, and, 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 and it's this really great uh, symbiosis. And in fact, when I, in, uh, uh, Canonical is kind enough to send me to uh, New York in, 
end of September to work, we, just before 1710 came out, we were already thinking about 1804. And the first thing I did was find, um, I'm not a GNOME Shell fan, so I'm still on, I was still on Unity, and I installed, a, got new, swapped out my hard drive, installed it, played with it for a couple weeks, and flew there, and immediately found a bug in the dock. So I said, great, file a bug here in Launchpad, file a bug upstream, I hate filing bugs because it's hard work to file a good bug, but I only file good bugs. Um, ten minutes later, upstream said, uh, one of the de uh, developers said, oh, hey, uh, uh, that's odd. Yeah, you're right, that shouldn't be that. Hold on. And 45 minutes after that, um, said, yeah, I fixed the problem. This was the problem, this is the, the patch. There's a pull request against, uh, it was fixed upstream, and there's a pull request uh, in uh, our fork against our, our fork. So um, there's a really lovely uh, upstream relationship where we're working really hard so that um, we have a really good experience, but you can also customize it to your heart's content. Um, at the same time, uh, you can definitely, uh, so say, say you love GNOME, GNOME Shell, and you want to run Ubuntu for all the other reasons, um, the support, lifetime, uh, and so on. Um, you can take Ubuntu 710, or 1710 or 1804, open up a terminal, type apt install gnome dash session, and you get this. You get, uh, well, you log out, you go to your username, you click on the gear icon, you pick a gnome, and you get this. You get, uh, minus the wallpaper, you get, um, you get vanilla gnome. So we have a really great uh, transitional interface for gnome shell that we're continuing to improve and iterate on, and, and we'll do so more in the future. But if you go from 1604 to 1804, users are going to, it's going to be different, but familiar and easy to, 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 to learn. And if you really want a GNOME, um, you get it. In fact, if you were running Ubuntu GNOME 1604 and you upgrade, this is what you get by, the, by default. So we worked really hard to, um, to, to uh, work with GNOME. And in fact, um, GNOME back in 2010, when we were thinking about Unity and the new the face of uh, the desktop, was very hostile um, towards uh, external ideas and contribution. That's since changed. Now, I didn't know this because I said, well, uh, I'm not a UI developer doing other stuff. But meanwhile, a GNOME has changed. So when we went back and said, we're going to go back to GNOME, we want to work together, how do we, how do we make our changes, uh, maybe have, give you improvements, how do we work together? GNOME said, that's great, we want to work together. And so um, if you are used to the acrimony between uh, the GNOME project and Ubuntu, um, it's not there anymore. Um, while sort of feelings always linger a little bit here and there, uh, the GNOME project has been incredible. And so, for example, we used session support to enable you to have either our great defaults or um, GNOME's defaults. And um, so we said, well, great, how do we make this even bigger and better so it's stronger and every distro can use sessions and ship default vanilla GNOME with very little changes but have their own customization? GNOME said, great, let's, let's talk about that. We're talking about indicators. We're talking about uh, ways to share technology so that um, and, and help improvements. So when Ubuntu says, "Well, we need this, and we're going to do this own thing," we say, "How can we implement this in a way that's not going to interfere with your plans?" And so that relationship is new, but very encouraging, very strong, and is still continuing today. So the present today is we have GNOME, we have GNOME Shell, we have a really nice way. Oh, if you want Unity, by the way, if you've upgraded. You'll get that GNOME shell uh, inter interface on the login prompt. You click your name, you click the gear icon, you can pick Unity and you can go back to it. Or just like I said, you can say apt install GNOME session and get perfect GNOME, vanilla GNOME. You can do apt install Unity session and it will pull in Unity. So that's still going to stick around for those of you who still want it, um, like myself. Uh, it's not going anywhere as long as it's kind of minimally maintained. Canonical will still keep it working with the XORG drivers. Um, and so forth. So we're working really hard on a really solid, stable desktop. Now, the thing about LTSs and, 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 and software these days is that you have um, lots of great applications, and the Ubuntu guarantee of stability is that we're going to ship applications, we're going to maintain them, you're going to get bug fixes, you're going to get security updates for up to five years in the desktop. Remember, six, 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 oh, uh, six, I just said three years, um, it was five years on the server, three years on the desktop, now it's five years for everyone. Um, so if you really love Unity in 1604, you can keep using that until 2021. 
Uh, Unity is also still in 1804, and then you can use that until 2023. So there's lots of options. The problem is, is that we have these, all these great applications. LibreOffice is the best office suite out there for general purposes. Uh, VLC, for example, isn't shipped by default, but it's like the best media player out there. Um, I, I love Calibre to manage my ebook collection. I'm an author, as I said, and a writer. Um, and so uh, I use that for my Kindle, but it's an older version. And so we, uh, the question is, how do we, um, you don't want to have a, you know, 5,000 desktops deployed across your enterprise and wake up one day and now you have LibreOffice 17 and also it's an saving a new file format and it doesn't read any of the other file formats. It's all, it changes all the fonts to wingdings. You don't want to wake up and deal with that. So that's our guarantee you get the same software. But sometimes you want that new software. If you, you can use 1604, um, like I said, till 2021. That's a long, long time. It's three more years. Um, but you may, but LibreOffice 6.0 is out. And so um, you're still stuck on LibreOffice 5.3, I believe it is, um, in, in 1604. So the question is, how do we deal with having a really solid base? We have, we have great relationships upstream. Um, things are better than ever. Um, how do we keep these applications, if, people, if you're gonna use Ubuntu and rely on it for a long, long time, how do you keep applications fresh? Because remember, the goal of an operating system isn't to use the operating system, to have a platform to run other programs and get out of your way so you can interact with those applications. So those need to be there as well. The answer came out of the phone. Um, when you have a phone, you can't install things and have broken dependencies and then like, everything's broken and you just reflash your phone. That doesn't work. And so while we didn't stick with the phone, we worked really hard to, uh, to have technology that was reliable and um, super, super, super um, uh, dependable. And the answer uh, grew out of the phone. Um, we had click packages to the phone. We kind of made a super click package. Click 2.0 was called Snaps. We knew we could run on embedded devices, which again, can't be upgraded, can't have dependency problems, can't have failed installs, and can't be reflashed if you have like 15 of them out, you know, across the state or the country. Um, so Snaps are a way to develop things. Now the cool thing about Snaps um, is that it's made of different modules. And so, um, uh, even to 16.4 shipped with Snap support, 18.4 is even bigger and better on the desktop. Uh, with the Snap, you have a core Snap uh, that is downloaded and installed, and it's even to 16.4. It's the tiniest it's little uh, uh, seed system drivers and, and, and libraries and so on, rather, libraries. And then when you have a program, it's compiled for 16.4, because that program runs against that core Snap. That program that you compiled for 16.4 and you've released now runs on any platform that supports Snaps. So that one program will run, so if you, if you take a program and compile it and then copy the files over to different Linux distributions, it'll break unless all the stars align, the plants align, and all, every library version is exactly different. Because we have a core Snap as part of the, the uh, Snap experience, that one program uh, runs against um, Ubuntu 14.04, Ubuntu 16.04, uh, 17.10, uh, they in RIM as well, but um, they're not supported. So 14.04, 6.04, 7.10, 18.04, without modification. It also runs uh, on Arch, OpenSUSE, Fedora. Um, we're working on Debian. Um, that same program runs basically everywhere, everywhere that supports Snaps. And so for, uh, for free software, you can always recompile it. You have the source code. Um, but it's a lot of work and a lot of, um, if you've never packaged software for a, a distro, for Debian and for Ubuntu and Fedora and for you know RPMs and everything, good because it's really hard and they're all different. And it's a lot of work and you got to test them all. With a Snap, you do it once; it works everywhere. So not only is it easier uh, for uh, smaller uh, developers, but also for proprietary software where you don't have uh, source code and where the vendor doesn't want to support 20 different Linux uh, platforms. Snaps provide one single platform, and so with Snaps. Software can come directly from the developer. And what that means is that instead of waiting for it to hit the Debian repository, it gets pulled into Ubuntu, then it gets polished, and then so some uh, six to nine months down the road, it shows up in Ubuntu. Um, that program can show up right away. It gets pushed, the, the developer compiles it, tests it real quick, pushes it to the store, um, promotes it to the stable channel, and your computer's checking three times a day to make sure that um, it finds a new version, it updates it automatically, the updates are atomic. Uh, when you install a Debian package, every single program you've ever installed on Ubuntu, through a Debian package, through Ubuntu software, however, however it may be, 
um, double clicking on it, you put in your, uh, your uh, uh, password, and you give that package root access to your computer because uh, there's an install script that takes your files, sprays them all over your file system, puts them in user bin, and puts them in uh, user shared, and Etsy, and so on. Um, every single program is decompressed, takes up more room. You've got the original archive, you've got all the decompressed stuff. You've given the package maintainer root access to your computer. Now, the way a snap works, it's one file, it's a squashfs file, it's compressed, it's downloaded. To install, it's mounted in place. So it's still compressed, it doesn't take up any extra room than the download, and it, does n it never gets root access, um, and plus, uh, ap applications are actually sandboxed so that they can't go off. Um, the program itself sees, if it looks in root, it sees that core snap, not your actual system. Uh, many programs to be useful have access to your home directory. That's a, a plug that can, um, uh, that can be changed. Like on a cell phone, you can give access to networking or home or so on. And in 1804, there's going to be ways to, um, to really, um, a couple, couple plugs or a couple uh, access to things are granted automatically if they're requested. Um, some programs need extra things. And so software, Ubuntu software is going to give you an option uh, when you install it. Uh, here's some additional things it can have access to. And you get to decide whether or not you want to grant it access. You get that cell phone security on your desktop with a program that can always be the freshest software from the developer. And, um, and you can control the access. So snaps can be uh, confined to enhance security. Uh, Skype, for example, is not confined uh, for esoteric reasons. It almost works confined, not quite. Uh, Microsoft's working on it. Canonical's working on it. Um, but a lot of programs are, are confined, so um, they're really safe when you're getting software from uh, third-party developers. Uh, most of them are trustworthy, um, but all it takes is, uh, is our credentials to be compromised, and someone else can swoop in and compromise that PPA uh, or that software project. And so. Um, with snaps, you, you don't have to worry about that. Um, the the uh, uh, vulnerability surface is far, 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 far less. And snaps run on like a different version of Ubuntu. So Ubuntu's always had this goal to be a complete solution for your computer, to always be up to date, to be entirely uh, existing of free and open source software other than drivers where like, you don't have a choice. And so as we move from Unity, and as we go to GNOME Shell and we rejoin that community, I made a joke at the beginning that Ubuntu turned 13 and some of these strange new features, you know, popped up where there weren't features before. Um, and we all remember, I'm sure, very, very fondly um, puberty, but um, puberty also is uh, adolescence. And adolescence is where we not just suddenly get way bigger and become an adult, um, but where we, adolescence is where we reevaluate our relationship with ourselves and our uh, peers and parents and our community. And so as Ubuntu um, heads towards the 3.5 year mark in April, um, that's exactly what's happened. We've, uh, we've gotten closer upstream. We've, uh, we're shipping uh, you know, more vanilla packages. We have better ways to, um, if I told you 10 years ago that Microsoft was going to specifically package Skype for Ubuntu and ship it, uh, and that's the exact same code that's running on the phone and on Windows and on Mac is running on Ubuntu in a container that Microsoft supports. Everyone would, look, everyone would have looked at me like I was crazy. And because of the work Ubuntu did with Snaps, that same program should work. I don't know if it works on 1404, but that 1604 package works on 1710 and 1804 with no extra work on Microsoft's behalf, which is the way they like it, and uh, no extra work really on our behalf, on the end user's behalf, which is how end users like it. So uh, as we continue forward and we start charting a, a path of what's new for Ubuntu, we have a really, really strong, stable uh, basis to make that. So um, I hope that gave you some context as to where we've been, where, we're, where we are, and where we're going. Thank you very much. And um, <laughs> thank you. so um, we are actually, of course, we, Ubuntu has a booth uh, at the Expo floor, which uh, starts in, I don't know what time it is, in one, I can't read, in one and a half hours, we'll be there, we'll be Saturday and Sunday. Uh, we do have uh, computers with uh, the development version of 1804 um, running uh, on System76 hardware. Thank you so much, System76. We have um, 1710, and we are prepared to answer any and all questions.
And uh, I think I have five minutes, so if anyone has any questions now, I can answer them here as well. Although, as regards questions... Yeah, we have. At 3 o'clock, when we come back here, we have a whole session, the annual tradition of the Ask Anything You Want. It's ideal if it's about Ubuntu, but it could be about anything. But it's the Ubuntu Q&A, Ask Anything You Want. We'll do our best to answer it. If we can't answer it, we'll try to find it. But that's what we're doing at 3 o'clock here after our extended lunch. Yeah, so, yeah, we definitely, so while it's lunchtime, we, you know, we know the expo, expo floor does open at, uh, at 2, so we're not making anyone come back here to give a talk. You don't have to feel guilty. Go look at the floor, get an hour, you can come back. Uh, if anyone has questions about uh, Ubuntu or GNOME or anything like that right now, I'm happy to answer them. Um, if you need some time to think as you wander the expo floor, maybe look at the Ubuntu booth, you can come back and ask those same questions as well at 3. So, uh, yes, question. I was just curious about um, uh, maybe other platforms. Uh, my daughter uses, um, a, a, you know, a Linux Mint, um, and I'm, I use, you know, Ubuntu. My wife, you know, so I'm just wondering what is, I know it's based on, uh, you know, the those packages are ba based on uh, Ubuntu. What you know, what kind of support or will she, <laughs> will she need? Or will she, I mean, what, what do you? I mean, what's what's the, the plan forward for other? Distro, distros for you know, um, and I'm just trying to figure. You know, my, I'm just trying to figure out what you know, what, what I should do for that. Uh, You're acting a little so, so. You use Linux Mint now, right? We have we have both. We have both. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. Ubuntu 14.04, and then and okay. then Linux, Linux Mint, and then we have the Windows 10 and whatever else. So uh, Linux Mint, I can't speak to. They go. They take Ubuntu and they go off and do their own thing and have their own security updates. And so um, I usually don't recommend people use Linux Mint unless they really know what they're doing um, and, and are willing to say um, that some security updates uh, and fixes may not be available. And, and they're going to. I think there's a backports thing or something that you can enable them. But um, um, Ubuntu just does it for you. So that's it. Uh, when it comes to Ubuntu support, um, if you have 14.04, you can definitely upgrade directly to 16.4.4, uh, which is the newest version. Uh, I don't know if I gave the booth ISOs. Well, I'm going to be at the booth later, I think, for a little bit. Um, we're going to have ISOs. If you bring a thumb drive, we can give you an ISO 16.4.4, which is 16.04 with all the updates rolled in um, since April 2006, or 2016. As of March 1st was when it was released, so less downloading once you install. Um, you can go from 14.04 to 16.04. Um, then you have three years to determine whether or not you're going to migrate to 18.04. Um, like I said, we work really hard to make the interface very similar so that uh, familiar, so that um, we're going to reduce documentation uh, load as far as teaching new users and training. And so, on. so if that didn't answer your question, uh, see me after this or at the booth. Um, I was, you talked about the snaps and, of course, the, the new Unity desktop. How much have you done in terms of performance drop off or is there even better performance because it's been better optimized um, compared to the For original Unity? Well, it's both. It's two parts. It's snaps um, compared to, you know, native packaging versus running the snaps because there's compression and all that's involved with it. Is there a performance loss? at all when you're packaging an app like that? Good question. So uh, is there a performance loss with Snaps? Um, the answer is that the first time you install a Snap and you run it, um, the app armor uh, uh, profiles get compiled. And then so you click, and you're like, hmm, and then 20, 15, 10 seconds later, Snap opens up. And then you click, and two seconds later, it opens up every other time, right? Um, that's something they're working on. Now, as far as the Snap being entirely compressed and then having um, being needed to be constantly decompressed, uh, I don't know if they're using hardware acceleration for that, but in, in practice, uh, computers are so fast and we have multi-cores that um, I certainly haven't seen any performance changes uh, in snaps myself. I haven't run benchmarks, but it, it's, um, uh, it's, it's comparable. You can't tell. Um, of course, I, I run my home folders uh, encrypted and everything's being decrypted on the fly too. So um, that's the kind of thing where um, luckily computers have gotten so fast that that is easy stuff for computers. Um, I'm not aware of uh, performance problems related to that. Oh, and then also about the uh, the Unity desktop with the new s the switching to GNOME as the I guess the the back end for that is that is there a performance loss there or is it faster compared to the old? Um, the 
lenses are a little bit faster in GNOME, um, but they have, a, they have a, a, a daemon that runs in the background that constantly indexes your files. We have it turned off by default uh, in 1710 and 1804. You can, you can install, I think, Tracker D, and it just, it's running. So it's a little heavy when you first log in. We're looking at enabling that in the future by default and making that less of a performance problem. Um, you will find that, um, I think in many ways, GNOME shells a little bit faster, actually. Um, uh, I'm, I love Unity. I'm happy to wait. But uh, a little I've used GNOME shell. It's been, been very snappy. So, All right. Um, you want to bring it to three? Oh, okay. Will snaps become the um, are becoming the default in seventeen ten two, or is it eighteen oh four? Where where does that start? So Debian packages will never go away because that's how Ubuntu gets made. Okay, um, snaps are an alternative. In fact, the great thing about snaps is um, because they're modular, they're all self-contained, they're atomically updating, and they're completely sandboxed. Um, in location, if not uh, in what they can access, although several are. Um, so Ubuntu ships with LibreOffice. And if you want the new LibreOffice, you can install the Snap version. And if you don't want to abandon LibreOffice 5.0 for 6.0, instead of going out and getting the PPA installing and everything else gets uninstalled and reinstalled, right? Um, the Debian packages and Snap packages run side by side. There's, not only is there no conflict, there can't be conflict because Snaps are separate. So you can literally test drive it, see how it is. And actually, in 1804 will be a new option during a fresh install is a minimal, on a desktop image, minimal install, which is actual full complete Ubuntu install, uh, but without, um, uh, and you get a, a desktop web browser, a couple games utilities, but you don't have LibreOffice, you don't have all these other things. So if you know you want the LibreOffice snap, you can install a, a lighter, slightly lighter version of Ubuntu and just go for the snap. Right, so, but yeah, they, the devs will always be around. All right, everybody, enjoy your lunch and yep. enjoy the opening of the expo floor, and we'll be back here at 3.